Hi, everybody. Uh, well, welcome to the first practical of the bioinformatics class. Um, if the network is grieving you, um, that's going to be a little problematic. Most of this practical has been designed around the use of web uh, resources, web utilities, and so on. I would also mention that the, uh, the video that we record from my screen uh, will be uh, uploaded to YouTube. So if you haven't found the YouTube channel yet, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, you can see the URL right up here at the top, uh, youtube.com slash C slash David Tapp. Uh, you should be able to find a whole pile of other things, including some basic lessons about uh, using the R programming language. In the month of May, I will be teaching a little bit about Python. Uh, so uh, you should be able to take part in that class here on the week of May 6th and May 13th. Um, and those, le the, those lessons will also be appearing on the YouTube channel if I completely conflict with your schedule. So um, my, my goal is that as many students as can in this de department know enough about programming to be able to solve basic problems that crop up in research. Um, all right, so by now, uh, hopefully, uh, you have had access to the files that we made accessible uh, for this class. I'm, I'm sorry that the Wi-Fi network is, is grieving us, and as I said, it may shortcut a lot of what I would like to demonstrate today. Uh, so I had actually started with a, uh, a YouTube video from Illumina that I thought was really useful in explaining a little further how it is that uh, massively parallel sequencers work. You should also have uh, been able to download a, uh, a file that gives more of a script. Um, it was originally written in the first couple of days as a, what did we learn from each practical? Uh, so the tone sort of shifts from uh, what, did we, what were we expected to have learned uh, rather than here's what you should do. So if you, if you notice that shift in tone, uh, just recognize that was a, a changing vision of how I was using it. Uh, but all of, all of the materials that we're trying to go through now are intended to complement what we were learning this morning about the bioinformatics necessary for measuring genetic variation. Um, so there are a few different items that we want to work with. One is, of course, uh, this video uh, from YouTube. Let us see if it is going to link through correctly. Okay, I'm going to go and open this up. Uh, the sound is just coming through my speakers here, so uh, I appreciate you may, may not be able to hear it. ...is composed of four basic steps. Sample prep, cluster generation, sequencing, and data analysis. Showed, a little, uh, the light, uh, the, 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 the white, 
Yeah, that flash of light is what we're capturing on our photo cell. Those flashes of light, which, see, which uh, nucleotides produce light at a particular site, gives us our readout and sequence for that location. We have a green flash, so there's a G there. We have a red flash, so there's a T at the next position, and so on. Obviously, you need to have a good high resolution of the image you're capturing of the incorporation. Hundreds of millions of clusters are seen parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. The index one read timer is We always hear about that personalized medicine, right? Personalized medicine. How can we uh, how can we understand the best treatment for each person who enters our hospital? This has had a huge inroad in, in the space of cancer, particularly. You have a question? What's that? Pharmacogenetics, yes, absolutely. So in, in the case of um, say breast cancer, if you know that somebody uh, has a breast tumor that is uh, that's no longer receiving signals uh, from, uh, from like EGFR and so on, uh, it doesn't make any sense to treat them with a compound that requires that receptor activity. And if somebody has triple negative breast cancer, then you, you really have to work with one of the, uh, the treatments that isn't dependent on any of those three pathways for treatment. So being able to sequence at least those three genes in the case of triple negative breast cancer is, is quite useful to understand what kind of treatment. Uh, but I think there's more to it than that. Um, there are people with particular genetic variants that are very susceptible to uh, particular drugs. Uh, it's one that warfarin, I believe. Warfarin is a really, really good thing for you to take if you have a particular genetic variant. Um, so finding ways to test whether somebody does or does not have that is responsible practice before you can run a strike. So, Gradually, we should expect that sequencers become a more frequent uh, guest in, in our hospitals as well. Uh, so, we, we're, we're, we are working towards graduate degrees in a medical school, right? We, we think about how these technologies will eventually transform clinical practice. And there's probably nothing that, that pushes that more 
than the problem of, of biomarkers. This is something that we have, a, have had a group meetings about on a, a weekly basis for a while. How do we turn the research findings we have into medically actionable steps? It's a really big deal. It's something a lot of the people in this department are thinking about. In fact, many of the professors are, in fact, physicians as well. Our, our, our uh, division chair is, for example, expert pulmon pulmon pulmonologist. OK. So uh, now that we have that, uh, I'm going to come back to our directions here. So um, yes, they're able to separate different DNA template molecules randomly across a flow cell, flow cell. PCR amplify them to produce a bunch of copies of that molecule at that location and produce fluorescent signals that we can then read to do base calling for these sequences that we build. That we build. OK, now uh, what do you get? off of a sequencer? I think this is an important question, but uh, if, if you send a, sequ a, a sample over to the Center for Proteomic and Genomic Research for sequencing, first off, where is CPGR? Does anyone know? OK, right, so CAF is the university's services. And yes, we do have a sequencing facility that's part of CAF over at the Stellenbosch campus. That's correct. Um, CPGR is not part of this university. It's not part of UCT either. Uh, CPGR was created to provide services nationally uh, in sequencing and in proteomics. And it's, it's right over by Hutzkir. I can't really pronounce that correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, the, at Hutzkir uh, Hospital, we have uh, the CPGR over at St. Peter's Square. It's in a mall just upstairs from the pick and pay. It's a little weird, right? But you can, you can get your sample over there, and they will do the sequencing right there on the next Seq uh, 500 that they have. We also have other sequencers in town, though. CAF, of course, has the ion torrent. And then if you go right across the rail yard to uh, UWC, their Department of Biotechnology has an aluminum MySeq. So each of these sequences, sequencers has its strengths and, my, uh, its strengths and weaknesses. Um, but, uh, you know, we had five samples analyzed by RNA-seq over at CPGR for less than 50,000 Rand. 50,000 Rand is a fair bit of money, right? Do we, do we pay you guys 50,000 Rand to, to do your honors here? I'm, I'm seeing head shakes. Generally speaking, we don't pay that much for, for that. Maybe by the time you become master's students, you'll get bursaries of at least that much, right? So that, that's promising. OK, so let us then look at the product that results from this. Now, I've. Uh, I've got this, uh, I'm going to pull open my browser here. I'm going to get blank tab open. All right. I'm going to open the directory file right in here. I realize that's kind of smallish, so let me blow it up a little larger. Okay. So what we are looking at is a directory listing. I, uh, I assume you know that you can do stuff like this in Windows with just like the directory command, right? This is the same thing except under, under Linux. They're just operating systems. They look very slightly different. So here we see that a user named Proteomics in the group Proteomics owns a file called SRR824071 underscore one FastQBZ2. There are quite a few pieces to this. So um, I'm going to try to walk through this just a little bit. So this is the number of bytes in the file. All right, so are we talking gigabytes, megabytes? How big is this? So this would be two kilobytes. That would be eight megabytes. So 938 megabytes. So to, to one approximation, this single, this single sequencing experiment has produced a file that's one gigabyte in size. How much can you, how much can you jam onto a CD? Anyone know? A CD. We still use CDs somewhere, right? That's the question, yes. Anyone have a, he's guessed 250? Anyone want to go higher or lower? Okay, I'm going to force some decisions here. You either have to put your hand up for higher, or you have to put your hand up for lower. He said 250, so higher or lower? Higher? I'm talking megabytes, I know. Yes, yes, he said 250 megabytes. Does the CD hold more or less? One, two, three, four. I'm seeing some buy-in here. People are creeping in slowly. All right, let's put our hands down. It, who says a CD holds less than 250 megabytes? You know, the song is, the song is five megabytes. 
<laughs> He's using rationale. I like this. Okay, the answer is a CD holds about 650 megabytes. See, you said a song is five megabytes, and there was a critical failing in, in, that, in that assessment. Do you know what it was? <laughs> you are used to MP3s. MP3s are very heavily compressed. In original form, that song is probably more like 30 megabytes. Ah. Right, 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 right. Okay, so 650 megabytes is what you can fit on a CD. Will that fit on a CD? It's too big, too big. Some hold 700, 750 megs, but typically about 650. All right, so how much could you fit on a DVD, a recordable DVD? We'll make it a little easier. If you've got a DVD burner... Uh, exactly. Good thinking. Good thinking. Yes. Okay. Typically, the 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 burnable DVDs that we purchase can hold about five gigabytes. So, if you were trying to communicate your experiment to somebody else in the file that came back, you could put about five sequencing samples on one DVD burn uh, burnt DVD. That's not terrible. Okay. But I want to point out something else about this file. What's all this business back here? BZ2. Ah, see, this is where we get burned for my not having taught the first lecture of the series on computer science. BZ2 is a compressed format. It's a, a lossless compression format that allows us to squeeze down these data very, very tightly. So we see that this first file right here has been compressed. Now we, we can look down here and see the same file name, this, this time without BZ2. So you're probably accustomed to seeing stuff like .zip, zip files. Yeah, zip is another kind of lossless compression. All right. So in this case, I have run some software called bunzip2. It's the opposite of bzip2. So bzip2 makes these, these compressions. Bunzip2 decompresses them. And you can see that our file size has changed. So we started at about a gigabyte. And down here, we've got kilobytes. Uh, that is megabytes, gigabytes. Did you see that? Just by unzipping the file, we went from one gigabyte to five gigabytes. All right, so sequencing data are big. Now, I would, I would further point out that these data came from a publication in the year 2014. What does that tell us about the sequencer used for this experiment? That would be five years ago. The technical term is obsolete. Sequencing technology moves incredibly quickly. As a result, if you're dealing with an instrument from three years back, you're probably dealing with something that's very much the last generation. So sequencing, in this case, uh, if, if you had subjected these same samples to the next Seq 500 over at CPGR, which is not a current instrument either, you would produce files that are much bigger than this. So sequencing data are pretty darn massive, and uh, we, we, we have to be able to take that into account when we're dealing with it. Frequently, the algorithms that we use for handling sequencing data are not something you want to run on a laptop. Laptops are awfully, an awfully easy way to lose important data in any case, so got to be careful about that. Now, did I include an example of what that FASTQ file looks like? Everyone saw this extension, right? FASTQ? All right, so FASTQ is the file type. This is most commonly the first product that you get from a sequencer. Someone hands, if you hand in a sample for your experiment, they're going to hand you back a bunch of FASTQ files, probably zipped. Okay. Did I include that? I don't think I did. That's awkward. Um, right. So I did not include what the FASTQ looks like, but... Um, in one of the earlier lectures, you would have seen uh, an example of this. Essentially, these are blocks of four lines at a time, and one of the key lines is the sequencing read itself. What letters did we observe on this particular read? And also a line of characters that represent the quality scores for each base call. So FRED is very much in operation, even though they're not using the code base from the University of Washington. The way that they compute uh, FRED scores may, may, may change depending on the sequencer type, but their goal is still to say 
what is the probability of error for this individual baseball? Okay, so, um, right, we're going to look at a fast QC report next. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up. Here we go. So fast QC is really, really handy software. Uh, obviously, looking through a fast Q file by hand is not a very viable option for trying to learn anything useful about it. But there's a whole lot of, uh, of reports that come out of this. So this is the per base sequence quality. This is kind of the most canonical report that we think about. I'm going to scoot it a little bit to the right here. All right, so in this case, we see a maximum value uh, of about 72 which is to say that the reads produced in this experiment went out to about 72 uh, nucleotides for each read. But what do you notice about these bars as they drop here? So this, this red line typically represents the median for a distribution. So we see that our, our median is falling from a high value to a relatively low. Sorry, I can't really see it all on screen at the same time. You can see that at the top of this, uh, this graph, we have a score of 40. Okay, so from our discussion this morning, what does 40 tell us about the accuracy, the error rate, for an individual baseball? We talked about it the other way around, didn't we? We talked about if you know the probability of error, you can translate that into a Q value, right? So what did we do? We expressed it in scientific notation. We looked at the exponent. We multiplied that by negative 10, and that gave us the score. Now we have to reverse that series of operations. So instead of looking at this as a 40, go ahead and divide a 10 off of that. Gives us 4, right? And then say 10 to the negative fourth. That is the probability. So 10 to the negative fourth, said in other words, is what? Okay, 0 0.00001. One in yeah, one e minus four, yes, which, which is one in what? One in ten thousand. That's right. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if I heard it back there. <laughs> one in a thousand. One, yeah, one in a thousand would be a score of thirty. An error, uh, an error probability of one in ten thousand is a score of forty. So the software is using that as a high value, it's saying if it's higher than this, you don't care. It's accurate enough, basically. So what, what it's showing then is that the median, as we go to longer and longer, uh, uh, further and further along in these, these uh, reads, is starting to sag below 40 about the time you have uh, 20 uh, nucleotides. And by the time you get all the way over to the right, to the 72nd uh, letter, the probability is that you dip down into the 30s uh, pretty, pretty far. So what would, what would you do if your sequencing data came back and you saw that you were all the way down in this red region with the, the scores at the, the three prime end of the reads? You might be a little concerned, right? You, you've got some sequencing base calls that you don't trust very much. So there are a lot of tools available to trim sequences. Things like Trimomatic, for example, which I just think has a great name. What does it do? It trims your sequences. Very clear cut. So FastQC is a way to sniff through the sequencing experiment and decide whether its results are robust. Great. So let us come back to our, uh, our document here. All right, this time we're going to go to the GWAS catalog. Uh, did I see a question for me? I thought I saw a hand. Didn't see a hand? Okay. So the, the GWAS catalog, what was that? Oh, uh, that's fine. <laughs> I've spent my time as the class smart ass too. <laughs> All right. So GWAS catalog is a great way to go browsing through all the GWAS literature. Could we use Google Scholar to achieve this? Yeah, you could, you could look for GWAS and some disease you find interesting, and maybe you would find a hit. So uh, we, we could be really uninteresting and just type the disease that a lot of us work in, tuberculosis. But maybe you have a really interesting disease that you think would be a good thing to look for. Is there a genetic factor that leads to somebody developing X? Does somebody want to put one forward? 
Parkinson's? You're a genetic student, aren't you? <laughs> ah, Parkinson's. Okay, fine. Parkinson's. All right, so we will we'll simply type this in and see what happens. Parkinson. Do you want it with the apostrophe S, or do you want it uh, just Parkinson? What? Apostrophe S. Oh, look, there's a keyword. Parkinson's disease, common search. All right, what do we get? Okay, publications, traits, etc. So here we see that they have a term within this. Uh, I think this may be part of an ontology. It's a special kind of, of controlled vocabulary that we'll be talking about a little bit more uh, next Monday, actually. So we can just click on that to get directly to uh, a collection of information about this. So is the web going to respond? We have hope. Mm. Yes, they, they give us cookies. Oh, class is always better with cookies, I have to think. All right. Really wants me to accept those cookies, but it, it's not going to let me. I agree. I agree. Go away. Thank you. Okay, we see that there are 29 synonyms. See, idiopathic PD. Idio Does everyone know what idiopathic means? It does not mean pathetic. <laughs> yeah, no, no. yeah, so I have uh, so a condition called idiopathic pneumothorax which means that occasionally my lung lining detaches itself and I scream a lot, <laughs> right? So not associated with a particular disease, but it's, it's one of those things that happens, right? So non-associated Parkinson's disorder uh, syndrome, Parkinson's with the apostrophe, Parkinson's without the apostrophe. They've, they've tried to bookmark all the different terms that people use in order to get to that, uh, in order to make, uh, make that less problematic. All right, map terms, reported traits. We have traits, let's look at them. All right, Lewy body pathology. Anyone know what a Lewy body is yet? Oh, it'll come, it'll come. All right, uh, familial condition. Coffee consumption interaction. Oh, that's cool. You drinking coffee? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Get <a shake> <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> all right, it's fine. So we have all these different, uh, all these different values. Child traits, highlighted studies, associations. So if you were trying to figure out which genes have in the past been associated with Parkinson's disease, you can come through here and just look them out. Now, is this a gene name? No, it's not a gene name. We talked about these earlier. What, what kind of accession is this? This is a SNP, yeah. When you see an RS, that's frequently something you could go look up and say DB SNP or something. Right. All right, we have a P value. Is this a random association? Their statistical test says this is two in a million. Their p-value uh, annotation motor outcome RAF number OR. Does anyone have a cue on what OR would be? Typically an odds ratio, an odds ratio. So it, does somebody with this SNP have a a, a greatly increased chance of developing the disease, or is it just a very minor contributor? Something like that is valuable to have. CI, you just made it out of statistics, so I hope you have a CI. Confidence interval, very good. All right. And finally, we get to mapped gene. So I, I would urge you to take mapped gene with a very big grain of salt when, you, when you're looking at GWAS studies. Remember that the SNP may be very, very close to the gene. Ideally, it would be right in the middle of that gene, which would cause you to think, ah, this, this variant is in fact part of the pathology of the disease. But more frequently, these SNPs are somewhere near the gene. Okay, and the reported trait back here. So having started with the disease, we were able to go into the information from GWAS and very quickly come back with an assessment. Does this come from one paper? Did anyone spot that? Let me back up one. I'm going to just scoot back one page here. Oh, the associations were down there. Oh, 
So the associations table was what we were looking through there. But you also see that there's a link for studies. Oh, it's really going to... How many studies? Ah, okay. So that information, that table, was not from one study, but rather from 36 papers that people have racked out on this. So obviously, if you were to do a new GWAS, uh, you would think about how the data you're accumulating can add to what's already out there. Simply publishing yet another GWAS because people have been doing it, so why shouldn't I? It's a really bad idea, frankly. It, it's much harder to convince reviewers that yet another study is necessary unless it adds in some way to what exists there. Now, what if all 36 of these studies were in European-derived uh, populations? Certainly, that's not going to be representative of the whole world. Um, ideally, you know, some folks in Asia would have done a, a, GWAS, uh, a GWAS study for Parkinson's in the Han Chinese population. We could add one from uh, the Nguni language group folks uh, here, here in South Africa. There are all kinds of things that we can contribute that build upon what's been done previously. Just by being in South Africa, you are already faced with research opportunities that are much harder to come by in the States. You know, I, I don't know that people know this, but I wasn't even immunized. I was never given a vaccine uh, to develop any sort of immun uh, immunity to tuberculosis. So a shot that all you guys got when you, were, when you were infants, I never had. Because in the United States, getting tuberculosis is rare. As a result, the kinds of studies we do in this department in tuberculosis are simply not possible in the United States. And frequently, we end up having to collaborate with universities here just to get our hands on the samples that are going to be interesting for interrogation. So there are disadvantages uh, in, in terms of what technologies are available to us frequently here in South Africa. But there are research opportunities that we face that cannot be had in the developed world or the overdeveloped world, as some people have started saying. Okay, Grant, so I wanted you to know that GWAS catalog exists and that it's a great starting point if you're trying to find, for example, the usual suspects. What are the genes that in the past people have, have attributed to this particular uh, phenotype? Okay, now we are going to go to Gene Expression Omnibus. GEO is one of my favorite repositories, um, and it is... Uh, it has a, an abundance of, of very useful information in it. I'm going to close off some of these uh, YouTube tabs. They're not helping us. Close those off, close those off. Okay, gene expression omnibus. Now, I, uh, I mentioned that we wanted to look for somebody with the name Demene who has been doing some interesting work in asthma. So I'm going to just start by typing in Demene. All right, and I run my search. Well, it's got one result. Is it going to show me? Okay. Mission accomplished, right? Everything worked great? Did it work great? Did it, did it look up MNA? No. The software assumed I'm an idiot. This is a common feature in a lot of tools out there. They looked at the word Demene, the, the surname Demene, and decided, well, gosh, surely this bozo doesn't know what he's doing. He didn't mean Demene. He must have meant dementia, right? <laughs> so it is instead showing the results for dementia and is ignoring what I said I wanted to look for. Do not assume that the software is right. Frequently, the software is messing you around. So mess right back. Say, no, no, I really did mean find Demene. Aha, here we go, a genome-wide association study for bronchopulmonary dysplasia using DNA pooling. Okay, now I'm going to return to my directions here. All right, 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 right. Yes, all right, I want to know several things about this. One of the, the first things that you should, you should be thinking about anytime someone says, there's a great new study that claims to have cured so-and-so, is... The question of N. When you talk about N in statistics, what are you talking about in study design? The number of samples involved, right? So in this case, what is the N for the study they're publishing here? 
I'm going to make the text a little bit bigger. Whoa, look at that. Okay, it's big. Where was it? 16 samples. Okay. So I can click on 16 samples and get a quick bit of information back. Great. Okay. So we have some Caucasian controls. Rep 4, Rep 3, Rep 2. Cord blood. Oh, whoa. All right, that's not an easy sample to get. Cord blood 1 through 4. All right. Now we've got Caucasian cases 1 through 4. But they've got 16 samples, right? Ah, we see that they have included uh, some folks with black African ancestry, replicates one through four, and cases as well. So here they, they, they've actually created a study that represents people of different ethnicities as a, as a way to see if they're missing some of the gene genetic variability in just looking at, for example, a white population. But one of the things you should be able to take away from glancing through this is that they've got a, a kind of two-factor study. On the one side, we've got cases and controls, and then we have a Caucasian group and a black group for, for both of these. And in each of these four boxes that they've described, they have an N of four. Okay, so would you say that study is highly powered? Got a big head check here. She says no. Is that enough power? I haven't given you enough information, actually. So when we ask questions about power, we have to know how big an effect are we looking for? How, uh, how big a, a difference are we, uh, would, would be acceptable to overlook? Things like that are really necessary before you, uh, how, how much variability do you have in, in the values that you measure for a given cohort? If you don't know those things, it's very difficult to say how big an N should you want. Ultimately, Four, to me, smacks of somebody who was doing an experiment design under the assumption that one of them might fail and they really wanted to use t-test. <laughs> so if one of the four experiments failed, they still had three that they could compare to three in the other cohort. That is a very unscientific way to go about designing for power, but it is a very frequently used system out there. Hopefully, your experience of the statistics module uh, did teach you that doing at three replicates here and three replicates there is not always scientifically defensible. Occasionally, having a big N helps you to solve some problems that you wouldn't be able to solve with a three-on-three -three comparison. All right, great. So that has now given us some indication of the N, but we can also look at these platforms. Now, what are the platforms? I'm going to just hover the mouse here and see if it responds. Nope, not quite that clever. Platforms. Does anyone have a, a clue what that, that might be useful for? Okay, the platform in this case says we have a measurement and the measurement was made by a particular technology. So we're going to drill down on one of these. All right. GPL6987. Here we go. This was collected on an Illumina human hap 651 version 3 genotyping B chip. Now you know, right? So a B chip is a lot like a microarray, but it's a, a much more extensible technology. It used to be that we were just always working for more and more features on each microarray, more and more DNA probes that we could launch onto a chip. But uh, eventually the designers thought it would be a whole lot more flexible for them if they were able to combine beads that had different oligos on them as probe sequences. In this case, we see that the description puts this at 655,000 SNPs. And they're drawn from the International HapMap Project, which was one of the very first big studies of human genetic variation. So given the information that came back from HapMap, they've created a, a SNP array for this. Now, I'm going to push you back to the slides this morning. We were, talking about, uh, we were talking about the very first GWAS, which was run uh, in macular degeneration. Does anyone remember how many features they looked for on their chips? Rough number. Ah, what's that? Oh, okay, yes, this, this morning we were talking about, uh, we were talking about 
the study of macular degeneration that launched the GWAS craze when it was published in Science. Does anyone remember how many SNPs they were looking for on their, on their trip? Higher or lower? <laughs> no, sorry. What's that? There were actually two different numbers that I showed you in the slides. The first one was the number of features on the chip. The second one was the number of features that they used. And they are slightly different. They, they felt that some of their probes were not very good quality. So they dropped to about 103,000. 103,000. Yeah, I heard, I heard it. You also said 200,000, though. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. All right. So we see that that study was published in 2005. This one was published in 2008. Look how big these numbers are compared to what they were doing before. Microarrays were created uh, commercially in the 1990s, but they were still growing rapidly in the density of the features that they offered on each one. And here we see that only three years later, it was possible to buy a chip commercially with 655,000 SNPs on it. That is not by any means the largest chip out there. The features in, in many contemporary chips now run into the millions. Okay, so we've learned a little bit about the kind of information we can get back from this study. I want to point out that we often, especially as junior graduate students, think that the published version of the analysis is the best one. The reality, and one of the things that you pick up as a more and more jaded senior researcher, is that, generally speaking, several years after the data have been collected, you can make better sense of it by applying the, the better frameworks that exist in a mature field. So the reality is that by re-downloading the data for studies like this, and you can download all of the, the original data right, right down to the cell files, and reprocess them using better developed tools now and come up with different findings than what the original authors did. I, I personally think that's an awfully good reason to be in bioinformatics. Okay, great. So we've now had a quick look at the gene expression omnibus and we learned that there were two different bead-based arrays that were used, uh, used to examine genomic variants discovered through PathMap. Great. So we have the ability to look in repositories and find data sets that help us answer our questions here. Okay, now last year, uh, polyphen was problematic. We're gonna try it though. This is, a, this is a, uh, a phenotype evaluator. We want to know, does a sequence variant cause a, phen a phenotypic impact? So let us see if polyphen is going to respond. Okay, polyphen. All right, all right, all right, all right. Polyphen. Prediction of, oh, sorry. Prediction of functional effects of human non-synonymous SNPs. So, how did those, how did these data get to us? First off, where am I going? Where am I, where am I seeking these data? Anyone read it? Harvard EDU. Okay, where, where is Harvard? United States? Anyone say the city? Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's okay. How do data get from Cambridge, Massachusetts to here? Is there a wire stretching from Cambridge to Cape Town? What's that? The cloud, the cloud. <laughs> Would you care to elucidate how the cloud works? <laughs> All right. The, the short version is that data get, to the, get from the United States to South Africa via undersea cables. And it's not one cable. There is not one cable stretching from Boston to Cape Town and we get all this privileged use of it. Instead, we're using undersea cables typically to Europe. So every time you hit a web server in Boston from Cape Town, the, your request goes from here to maybe the UK or to mainland Europe, and then gets forwarded on another undersea cable across the Atlantic. That server then has to take some amount of time to respond, and then it sends that information back across, not to us, to Europe, and then it comes through another router down here, if things are going well. 
<laughs> so there's a lot of traffic between Cape Town and Europe, or Cape Town and the United States. I mean, how are you going to watch cat videos, right? The cat videos have to come from somewhere. So um, I would point out that frequently, if you have to make the choice about whether you're going to use a remote server in the United States or a, rem or a remote server in Europe, you're better off to look for a European server if you're in South Africa, because then you can avoid the jaunt across the Atlantic. Just a quick thought. Okay, so we see that Polyfen is going to behave just the way it did last year. Um, the example is there. Ah, yes, there it is. I can try reloading here, but I, I'm, I'm not going to mess with it. I would just note that this is one of the drawbacks of being pretty far from where these uh, the, these tools get developed. If I can, if ideally, I would find a mirror for the Polyfen service that's located in Europe. That would make this much easier. Ideally, someday, South Africa will have mirrors of its own, of all of the NCBI tools and all of the NCBI databases. That day is not today. Okay. Uh, so you can see that the study that I had given, uh, the, the test I had given us, was to look at this gene, CFTR underscore human. Does anyone know what the CFTR human gene is? CFTR. That is the cystic fibrosis uh, transmembrane, <laughs> oh gosh, right, uh, the, uh, the transmembrane conductance regulator. It's a special gene because if, uh, one of the most common mutations that we find in human populations, uh, a common allele for it, has a change from a phenylalanine at position 508 to tryptophan. So what I wanted to do was to run that through Polyfen and see what, what its reply was. Is this, is this an acceptable uh, mutation, or does it in fact cause something bad? So just from a, a, an amino acid point of view, I'm a proteomic tech guy. I have to ask it this way. Well, do you see any similarities between phenylalanine and tryptophan? Phenylalanine and tryptophan. Rings. Very good. Very good. Rings is a good word. Okay, so when you see phenyl in something, you should think, ah, it's got a ring in it. Right, so phenylalanine is a pretty hydrophobic amino acid. What about tryptophan? Big, small, hydrophobic, big, hydrophobic. It's big. It's the biggest of the amino acids, in fact. What else? Anyone have other opinions about tryptophan? It's big. It doesn't have a ring in it. Beyonce could sing a song about it. It's got a ring on it. All right, so tryptophan and phenylalanine both have rings. That's good from the start. So you might think replacing a phenylalanine with a tryptophan is not that big a change. It's adding, it's substituting one ring structure for another. In fact, it causes a very desperately bad disease. If you don't have phenylalanine at that particular position, the protein misfolds. And it misfolds in a way that the cell detects as misfolded, and as a result, it destroys all the copies that are misfolded. Now, if you have a healthy and an unhealthy version of that same protein in that cell, you can still get by. But if you have two alleles in which this mutation has taken place, and it's pretty common that people do, you can no longer trans uh, you can no longer regulate the uh, the voltage across the, the membrane. And it creates really awful living conditions for people who have it. Anyway, so although it might nominally seem that replacing a hydrophobic amino acid with a hydrophobic amino acid, who cares? It actually has a big phenotype impact. OK, so let us, uh, let us pretend that everything worked great there. And now we will use SIFT instead. All right, close the polyphen example. I'm going to open the SIFT demo, OK. That's the URL. Um, OK, so SIFT has now become Provian, which is a much nicer name, I guess. Um, and I need to enter this particular okay, Provian protein. We're going to try to use the Provian tool itself. We need to give it a sequence. 
When we see fast A, we should always think, ah, it wants the sequence database to work with. Now, I had an example right here in my text file, so I'm going to just glom that in here. Hopefully, this is still going to be a legitimate, uh, a legitimate URL that will give us a sequence. Come on, Ensemble. Come through for us. The ensemble.org uh, ensemble is an incredible sequencing resource, very, very valuable to work with. Ah, and we see that we have a transcript that has come back. This is lovely. Okay. Is it going to give us a protein sequence? Protein summary, protein summary, some statistics. Anyone see the sequence? Transcript table. You can tell this thing has been studied to death. It's got 43,698 variations measured for it. But I want my sequence. Sorry, Provian wanted a protein sequence, correct? Yeah, in FASTA format. Oh. I have a fallback, so I'm gonna sneak oh I'm gonna sneak around and do that in the background here. Oh, there goes protein domains. It's coming. Is it waiting for me to agree about cookies? Yes, give me cookies. Ah, that's pretty. They've really improved the uh, sequence. It's lovely. But where is my sequence in letters? Can I get... Ah, protein sequence right here on the side. Were you guys someone trying to tell me about that a moment ago? I thought I heard someone over here saying, just click it, just click it. Okay. Here we go, protein summary. Oh, this waiting. Anyone have a good joke to talk? Clean, it's going to be recorded. <laughs> okay. A riddle. A riddle? Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a good one. Uh, not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's too much to ask. Okay, great. There we go. Look at that. So, do you think that I can just grab this whole thing? Oh, that's good stuff. All right, I'm now going to copy that to the clipboard. Coming up to Provian here. Now it says it wants fast day format. Is fast day format just a bunch of lines of sequence? It is not. I need to give it an accession number. So I'm gonna just say uh, CFDR. <laughs> okay, that's a very short version. A greater than symbol says this is a name for a sequence. CFDR is what I'm naming it. And now I'm going to just paste the rest of that monster in there. Great. Now, enter amino acid variations. The most common types of formats have something that looks like this. A P72R is to say that a proline that was located at position 72 has become an arginine. It's a pretty easy shorthand, right? So let us enter... F508W. Everyone see that? So this is going to be a phenyl, the phenylalanine at position 508 gets substituted with a W, which is tryptophan. Variant of interest. I'm just going to do that one because I'm feeling sleepy. All right, what database to use, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to skip over the email link and hopefully magic is going to just happen. It's been submitted. How long am I going to wait? Too long. Have some hope. It says it's going to refresh in 10 seconds. That, to me, is a pretty optimistic appraisal of how it's going to perform. Maybe we have to wait 30 seconds. Wait, you, we hold thumbs here, right? I hold thumbs. Ah! Magic! We got a response. This is brilliant. Okay, what did we learn? 
our query sequence was in FASTA format. We retrieved it from Ensemble using that link. There were 273 sequences that it could use to evaluate that, uh, falling in 30 different clusters. The threshold score, uh, it was trying to, it, it, before it calls something deleterious, it has to generate the score, and then the score gets compared to a threshold to tell you how it's translated for the user. So the score that we had was point, uh, negative 4.346. We compare that to a threshold of negative 2.5, we're below that, and in this scoring system, negative means bad, right? So here we see that given this cutoff score, this variant can be judged as deleterious. Grant, and it's going to keep the copy around for 48 hours. Okay, so there are a world of different servers out there for evaluating whether or not a variation is a problem or not. Um, Provian is just one of them. We saw that... Uh, we had, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> we had the one that we looked at just a moment ago. I, I'm drawing a blank on it. The polyfen algorithm as well. But we see that we can do these lookups, compare a, a new variant that we've detected by sequencing, and evaluate via these systems whether such a variant has been seen in the past and was found to be deleterious. It's pretty powerful. Okay. So with all of that done, we have worked our way through our list of input files. Was there anything else that we wanted to say here? We had some other variants that were included. You can, of course, work through those examples on your computer as well. But um, those are all in the input files that should be available by the Google Drive if everything continues um, working as it really should. OK. Um, if there are no further questions, I believe we are done for today, and we will reconvene tomorrow morning downstairs in the fish tank. If you if you need help finding the fish tank, I'll be help you to help, uh, glad to help you. But essentially, it's across the hall and down one floor below us, and it looks like a glass-walled fish tank. That's why they call it that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and kill the presentation for today, and thank you very much. This too should be appearing on the. Uh, on YouTube for everyone to download.